All right. So you guys are like, what are we doing today? More mer medical marijuana stuff? Yes. Because last week you asked me not to go over the questions and I obliged because I'm a great professor. <laughs> but um, we're going to go over those questions just to make sure that you understand the key components of this medical marijuana program. And then I'm going to get into the juicy stuff of the adult use. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explain to you what marijuana establishments we have in this state. And I'm going to generally talk about some of the requirements surrounding them. Next week, and, and I'm also going to talk about how they're licensed on the state level. Next week, we're going to get on through the municipal process where we're talking about host agreements and community outreach meetings. And, um, and, and, then, and so that's what, uh, and then we're also going to get into some of the operational requirements. So, how are these companies actually operated? It's important because many of you guys might end up as um, compliance officers. And it's extremely important that you find you you understand how these companies are operated so that you don't get slapped with um, fines like other companies have had. Okay, are we ready kids? Aye, aye Captain. Do you guys need me to do a recap of, of, of the basics of medical? We went through it twice, but I can do it thrice. She gonna go through it. No, I see some of the head nods in the, pe the, the, the people with no faces. All right, I'm gonna test you guys. So, I'm, so I'm, I have a PowerPoint presentation prepared with about 16 questions. I expect you guys to participate or else it's gonna be very lonely for me. Now, don't get me wrong, I can play by myself. I don't need y'all, but I want you guys to participate. Okay, are you ready? Let me, let me pull it up. Okay, can you guys see this first question? I will read it. Okay, James is a medical doctor who's licensed to practice medicine in Massachusetts. He operates a medical clinic. In answer, so go back one slide. This oh, slide. just kidding. I'm cheating. Thanks. Go back to one. Yeah. I'm blocking. All right, let's go back. There you go. Did you guys already see the answers, you cheaters? Just kidding. My mom said don't call people names, but I never listen. Let's go. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's start over, kids. I mean, grown, grown adults. Stop pressing that button, big mom. Okay, okay. <laughs> James is a medical doctor who is licensed to practice medicine. We'll get through this in Massachusetts. Um, he operates a medical clinic in Weedsville, Massachusetts, where he issues written certifications to qualifying patients. His brother shows up to his clinic one day and asks James for a written certification, right? Knowing that Mark suffers from debilitating MS and having a good heart, James issues a written certification on the spot. Is the, is the certification valid, you guys? No, because you can't write certifications for your family members. And in, in addition, you cannot write, not only that, but you can't write a certification without having um, a bona fide healthcare patient provider relationship, conducting a clinical visit, using the Massachusetts prescription monitoring program to make sure that they're not uh, getting more than they're allowed, um, completing and documenting the patient's medical history and explaining the potential benefits and risks of marijuana use. Also, they, he would have to play a continuing role um, in treating this ailment. So if, if they did all that and they were still siblings, they, they could do the certification? Well, you got to wait for the next question. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, play. <laughs> but you're right. And I thank you for being ahead. You out here. Okay, next question. It might be the next question. Who knows? All right, let's go. Now, Samuel is a certifying, cert, is a certified certifying nursing practitioner. Somebody please get on the CCC and rename these categories for me. All right. Whose brother Mark suffers from MS? We talked about him in the last question. Samuel works at the same medical institution that provides Mark, that provided Mark with his written certification. So these are brothers working together at this medical facility. When Mark noticed the sudden decline in his own health, he asked Samuel to be his caregiver. Samuel wanted to personally oversee Mark's treatment and agreed to allow Mark to register him as his personal caregiver. Can Samuel be Mark's personal caregiver? No, an HCP cannot be a personal caregiver. Samuel, yeah, Samuel cannot be Mark's personal caregiver because he is Mark's HCP. 
Now, when it comes down to it, to answer your following question so that I wanted to answer it here, an HCP is permitted to prescribe medication so long as it's in agreement with whatever they would be allowed to do with the Ameri with their AMA. So if the if the board in Massachusetts allows you to have you, to be your the doctor for your um for your sibling, you're permitted to do that because you have to abide by very strict oaths and and have very strict uh, uh, ethics ethical codes. So within that context, they'd be permitted to 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 um, issue that written certification. However, they couldn't be the personal caregiver. Next, Brittany is a professional entertainer who suffers from a debilitating illness that renders her too weak to take care of herself. Brittany's best friend, Madonna, volunteered to be Brittany's personal caregiver. Madonna is already a caregiver to her own little brother, Two Chains. Can Madonna also serve as Brittany's caregiver? But you can, oh, you can have those caregivers you can, um, if one of them is an immediate family member. Got it? But you guys, understand that these rules are in, in flux right now. We're in a we're in a in a in a in a period where the CCC is currently reviewing the regulations to make changes, and some of these changes have been to the number of patients a personal caregiver can have. I think under the new proposed regulations that we talked about, they're contemplating, I believe, giving five to ten per per personal caregiver. Now, again, the T, the CDA is trying to oppose that because that would really impact their business. Does that make sense? Who's the CDA? The Cannabis Dispensary Association. It's like, the, that name, it's like dun, 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 because they're very powerful. Okay. So yes, because one of Madonna's patients is her brother, she is permitted to be the, uh, the personal caregiver to another patient. Okay. Next question. Lisa owns an MTC that is having a difficult time competing with the emerging adult use market. To drive sales to her MTC retail store, she hires a Massachusetts licensed physician to conduct medical evaluations and issue written certifications at the MTC. No HCPs can issue written certifications at MTCs because that would create unfair, unfair trade, right? Next question. Marjorie is a physician licensed to practice medicine in Rhode Island. While working as an intern at James Clinic for James's Clinic for this summer, Marjorie wrote a written certification for a qualifying patient under James's supervision. Is the written certification valid? An important thing too is you cannot delegate your authority to issue written certification. So even though James was supervising, he couldn't delegate that task to Marjorie because she could she didn't have a license to practice in Massachusetts. So you're right on. You guys are ready to start your own businesses. This is awesome. So Molly, unfortunately, is a 15-year-old leukemia patient. She's very independent and goes to most of her medical appointments alone. At one of her appointments, Lucas, her physician, suggested that she use medical marijuana to combat her symptoms and explained the risks and benefits of using marijuana. Finding it a good idea, she asked Lucas for a written certification. Lucas issued the written certification on the spot. Is this certification valid? An ACP cannot issue a written certification without parental consent, and you need two licensed certifying physicians to diagnose the patient, one of whom must be at least a pediatrician or, or a pediatric subspecialist. And, the, and it's not just having a debilitating co condition. It has to also be life-limiting illness, meaning that they have a prognosis of less than two years to live. So it's pretty dire. But of course, there's always that, that catch-all where if the doctor is willing to take the risk and go on paper for giving a, a minor the, a, a written certification, they can do it for other reasons. All right, question seven. Vincent was issued a valid written certif certification for his debilitating ALS. Although he can afford his medical marijuana, the closest MTC is 100 miles away. He can drive to the MTC, but making the trip every 60 days is starting to take a toll on Vincent. Vincent decides to register for hardship cultivation. Is this permitted? And let's just say that Vincent is 19 years old. Can he get a hardship cultivation? This is a hard, a hard question. <laughs> Let's see. So 
so the answer you're right it's most likely he's gonna have to have he's going to have to demonstrate that his access to the mtc is either limited because of verified financial hardship like he can't drive there but we already know that he has a car he can drive himself um physical incapacity to access reasonable transportation um as demonstrated by an inability to use public transportation or drive himself lack of a caregiver um, with a reliable source of transportation and a lack of an MTC that will deliver. So he also has to prove that there's no no MTC close to him that will deliver to his um, primary residence. And the last point, to your point, there's an, there isn't an MTC within a reasonable distance of the patient and lack of MTC that will deliver. So because of the d distance, they may find it too taxing on him and might allow him to, um, to uh, cultivate in his home. All right, question eight. So Trayvon is a 20 year old entrepreneur who made millions on YouTube making videos that make astronomy accessible to the average millennial. He would like to use his fortune to build the most well-known MTC in Massachusetts. Trayvon formed an LLC in Massachusetts and hired you to complete his license application. Will he get his, his MTC license, right? All right, let's go. Jamal would like to open an MTC in Massachusetts, but Jamal does not know the first thing about cultivating cannabis. He reaches out to his friend Camille, who operates three MTCs in Massachusetts and offers to make her a partner in the new venture. Is this venture permitted? That's it, you're referring to the no hoarding rule, right? But the answer is most likely, there's a way she could still kind of do it. You know, as lawyers, we always find a micro way um, that's kind of in the gray area. This is how you'd be able to do it. So the only way to avoid it, she'd have to avoid assuming control over the operation. So everything she provides will just be a, a, a light suggestion, which you can then use with your own team to determine whether you're going to apply it. I have no control over this. Um, she would have to be entitled to less than 10% financial interest or voting rights in the business and have no other contractual authority to control major decisions in the company. So if she did that, she could have more than that in the, in the, in the, um, in the state. And you guys, for your own personal knowledge, because I serve tea, I know a lot of MSO, multi-state operators in this, in this um, state, and they're not all bad. I work with some, and you're like, ah, oh, gasp. I work with the good ones. Um, where they own more than three, three because they own like 9.9% .9 of a business, and they have, they have no control over the operations, no say, no, right? It's great. So it, um, I don't work on the great contracts, by the way. Don't, don't indict me. But, um, I, but I do work on providing a access to people. We, why would I do that? Because banks don't have loans for people. And the only way to get people open is to work with people with actual money. All right, next. Bob owns an independent testing laboratory and would like to open an MTC in Massachusetts. He hires your firm to complete his application. Is Bob allowed to open his MTC? Now you see why I don't give written exams. My questions are too easy. I need you to teach me how to open a business. So he can't open it because you can't own an interest in a lab as well. All right, now we're done with the questions, you guys. I said 16, but we had 10. All righty. So you guys were amazing. You spared yourself this part but it's in these slides for you, for your review, if you'd like. So today we're gonna get into what a lot of us are excited about. Not that, I mean, I guess every year that I teach this class, I get more excited about the medical program. And that's because I fundamentally hate being a hater. Like I don't wanna be a hater and I kinda just, I'm glad that you're helping me make peace with that. Thank you so much. All right, <laughs> so um, let's get started. So what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna go over briefly over the timeline of policy reform we're gonna get into some of the uh, permits of adult use uh, regulation. I'm gonna briefly talk about state and municipal requirements and then get into the marijuana establishments for the beginning parts. So now let's talk about the timeline. So in 2008, we the people decided that we no longer wanted to see people going to jail just for having weed on their persons, right? We thought it was wrong. So we decided in 2008, we are going to decriminalize marijuana. And we did that through the Sensible Marijuana Policy Initiative, also known as Massachusetts Ballot Question 2. So 
What this did was it made possession of, of less than one ounce of marijuana punishable by a fine of $100 without the possessor being reported to the state's criminal history board. In addition, if you were a minor, you were required to notify your parents, take a drug awareness program, and complete 10 hours of community service, of community service. Before decriminalization, people were char charged, uh, faced up to six months in jail and up to a $500 fine. And then in 2012, we decided we're going to, we talked about this last time, that the patients needed to have access to, to, to medicine to, to, to treat themselves. So we legalized medical marijuana through a ballot initiative, ballot question number three. And in 2016, we the people decided that we wanted recreational marijuana. We didn't want just the patients and we didn't want to have to risk decrim. We wanted full legalization, full regulation. And one of the big reasons, one of the big um, reasons why legalization was able to pass was because despite decriminalization, you guys, the rate of arrest for people of color was still four times more like a person of a black person was still four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than a white person, even though statistically they were using at the same rate. So decriminalization did not deal with the social justice issues. And so that was really used. And, I, and, and I'm going to have Kim Na Na Napoli come and talk about this. She was the face of the, the Yes on 4 campaign. And now they strategically chose to, um, to lobby on the fact that uh, the, the, there were still disproportionate rates of arrest in the cannabis industry. And that really pushed it over the edge. So yay, Yes on 4, which allows me to be here talking to you about more than just medical marijuana. Okay, so what did legalization do in Massachusetts? And this is what we would happen in, on the statutory level. So first, there's a personal use provision that, that was created, and then there is right, there's um, the regulation in the taxation of marijuana. So first, <laughs> told you it's medicinal. <laughs> would this world-class athlete ever talk, put toxic matters in his, well, now he would, but back in the day. All right. Personal use of marijuana overview. So um, under the statute um, that codified the, um, the Yes on 4 ballot initiative, persons who are 21 years of age or older are allowed to possess, use, purchase, process, or manufacture one ounce or less of marijuana, but no more than five grams of marijuana concentrates. So within, so you're also allowed to have home cultivation, which is why I was really, I keep capping on um, the medical program because once you're 21, that hardship cultivation is really moot. You don't really need to go for it because you can legally have up to 10 ounces of marijuana at your house. Um, and you can have 12, you can have six plants if you're 21 years old. If there are two adults in the house, you can have up to 12 plants on your premises. So there's also the gifting provision. So under the law, you're allowed to give away or otherwise transfer one ounce or five grams of concentrate without any remuneration to persons 21 years of older, as long as the transfer is not advertised or promoted to the public. Now, when I taught this class last year, I'm sorry to bring this up, but there was an event that I invited you guys that I invited the class to, and it was an event that was held by the Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council in conjunction with this co group called the Creative Zone. The reason I'm bringing this up is this was a social consumption event that was taking place on public and a private property where people had to pay tickets to cook, to attend, but and, and and marijuana was given was gifted at the property, but you didn't buy the marijuana, so they were able to do that. Why, you guys? They did not advertise or promote that they were going to be gifting marijuana. It was just unspoken that you go to the creative zone. You, you, th that's what goes down there. And especially when you're surrounded by um, Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council. The reason I'm bringing this up is a lot of people want to know about social consumption. How can we do social consumption? I hate to burst your bubble. I'm, I'm actually going to um, do a spoiler alert real quick. We're not going to have social consumption for the, at least the next two years because um, the um, the regulatory body has to enact these provisions that will permit the local municipalities to begin regulating these en these entities. So that's so that's a fight that the CCC has not begun taking yet. All right, regulation and taxation of marijuana. So so let's get into 
um, how you guys can start getting into the adult use industry. So I'm gonna talk about the Cannabis Control Commission. We're gonna go over the state and local components, talk about marijuana establishment, get into equity and then licensing. Let's go. So the Cannabis Control Commission, this is the original group, the OG. They are not uh, all on, no, they're not currently all on the board, uh, on the commission. Um, so we have Steve Hoffman, who's the chairman. I am in communication with him. He is, he might come to the class this semester. So I'll let you guys know by next week. Um, Kay Doyle, um, Jennifer Flanagan, Britt McBride, Britt McBride, and Shaleen Title. Are you guys familiar with these, with the commissioners? So first, she will be stepping down, but she wanted to initiate a task force to crack down on the black market. And so um, that task force is still being discussed. And I don't know if you guys know why this task force was initiated, but I think I might have talked about it the first day of class, which is um, during the NCIA meeting um, last year in February, the police um, commissioner and a lot of the police officers had a secret meeting during the NCIA where they were talking about some of their fears surrounding legalization. And the primary fear was that they don't know what their jobs would be if they weren't out there um, prosecuting these marijuana laws because the vast majority of, of their employment came from that. So that was a major source of concern from them. And she want, and I don't know, she wanted to help them keep their jobs, I guess. Um, but that's no shade but micro shade. So um, Kay Doyle stepped down April 2020. Um, so she is no longer on the commission. Currently, the commission consists of Steve Hoffman, Jennifer Flanagan, Britt McBride. She'll be stepping down this fall, but she has not given us a, a definite date. Uh, and Shaleen Title is also on the commission. Um, do you guys know, out of all of these commissioners, how many of them voted in favor of legalization? Anybody? I want to give you, I'm going to let you know it's only one of them. And, I, and I'm going to ask you, <laughs> do you know which one voted in favor of legalization? Shaleen Title, you would be correct. She's the only one on the board who, who, who favored legalization. Everybody opposed it. So when we're talking about the, 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 the pace at which the, this industry is moving, we have people who, who, who didn't even understand the issues surrounding legalization to the point where they opposed it. You know, and so they, they don't know anything about this industry. So it was very, they had to learn very quickly and that cost us time and expansion. Is there going to be racial diversity? There could have been if I decided to go for a position. <laughs> I literally would feel like I, I, I spent my time gestating a baby just to not give, just not, to not raise it. That'd be kind of, you know, not that I'm against that, but like, I just, you know, feel sad to me. Um, but I think there might be, I, there are some open seats, you guys, and you're, you could, you guys could go for it. After this class, you're probably more qualified than they were when they, when they started. That's a micro shade. Chilean title actually was more qualified than I was. She, um, okay. Let's talk about the commission. Um, I think watching so much girlfriends has gotten me into like a very, a very girlfriendy mood. I'm giving you too much tea. Let's get back to the legal, to the legal stuff. Okay, Cannabis Control Commission, they have five commissioners. I talked about them, but right, right now they have four. Um, one is appointed by the governor and must have a background in public health, mental health, and substance abuse or toxicology. So now even understanding how they put these together, you see how it's embedded still in the stigma that marijuana is very, is, is dangerous and has to be studied like cocaine or heroin. So one appointed by the attorney general and must have a background in public safety. One is appointed by the treasurer and receiver general, and they must have a background in corporate management, finance, or securities. Um, two of them are appointed by, uh, by a majority vote of the governor, attorney general, and treasurer and receiver general, one of whom must have professional experience in oversight or industry management, including commodities, production, or distribution, and one has a legal background, policy, or social justice issues. And the social justice one is, is, uh, is Shalene Title. Um, uh, the finance guy, Steve Hoffman. I always get, Fl I think Flanagan was public health and Brick McBride was, uh, oh, uh, Flanagan was public safety, but I always get them confused. Um, and then the treasurer and the receiver general, they designate who the chair of the commission is. And the chair is currently Steve Hoffman. And again, he might come to the class. He always does, he loves coming here. And when he comes, like, ask him any question because he loves that mess. 
All right, next. So what are the requirements to be a commissioner? Well, before you get appointed, you have to undergo a background investigation where they look into your financial stability, um, your integrity, and, and your responsibility, including whether you have um, good reputation for good character and honesty. Um, unfortunately, if you have been convicted of a felony, you're not eligible to serve on the commission. Which is unfortunate because, because of the industry that we're in, I would have preferred someone with a marijuana charge who has experience within the, the, the prison system and outside the system. That would be impeccable. But didn't I tell you the first day of class, nobody listens to Big Mama, nor does anybody ask me for my opinion? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So overview, as we delve into what marijuana establishments we have, I want to talk about uh, briefly what the state and local components are. And we're going to talk about the municipal component, the local component next week. But in order for you to even apply to the CCC for your, applica with, uh, for your application, you need to have secured real estate. Now, you don't have to purchase it. You just have to have access to real estate. You have to have a community outreach meeting, and I'll explain what that is. But that's just a meeting where you invite people to come yell at you I and mean, ask you questions <laughs> about your business. Um, your host community agreement, we'll talk about it in your plan to comply with local zoning ordinance. So you have to submit these four components. And then the stake application is very, does this look like the, the, like medical? Very similar. They have three components, application of intent, background check, management, and operations profile. And that's what you need in order for you to apply. And during the, um, for your, uh, for your final, this is literally what you're going to do. You're going to have these seven sections. You're going to tell me there's going to be an ad two additional sections we'll talk about when we get there, which is taxation, raising funds, and financing. But you're going to basically go through your – go pick your team. You're going to be in teams, and you're going to tell me what your process for selecting your real estate is. And we have to talk about that process because you have to know how to look at zoning and what the requirements are. You're going to tell me about how to – what are you going to do for your community outreach meeting? What's required? What's required for your host committee agreement? So you, what is a host committee agreement? So I can't even tell you about what's required until we get there. So um, that's literally what your, what your, uh, your uh, final is going to be. It should be fun. A lot of people stress about it. And I say, don't stress, don't stress out. If you stress me out, that's a problem. <laughs> okay, just, just chill. You're going to have all the information. In the last day of class, I'm going to do a complete review where I break down exactly how I want you to answer these, address each of these topics. It's pretty much turnkey. You have to basically go out of your way to fail this class. Or not be funny. Like if your presentation doesn't make me laugh, it's automatic F. All right, just kidding. <laughs> All right, next. Are you ready? Municipal authority. Municipalities may pass bylaws and ordinances. This is what they're allowed to do in the context of regulation. They can pass, just like medical, they can pass bylaws and ordinances that govern the time, place, and manner of these marijuana establishments in businesses dealing with accessories. Um, they, they, the municipal ordinances are permitted, but as long as they're not unreasonably impracticable, right? Meaning that they're so difficult that they cause the, they would subject the licensees to unreasonable risks, right? that requires such a high investment of money, time, resources, asset, that a reasonably prudent business person would not operate a marijuana establishment. And again, I sent my shade last time where I said, these ordinances have risen to the level of being unreasonably impracticable. I need y'all to, to, to back me up on this so that we can take down these systems, but that's not what we're here for. I'm gonna teach you guys how to start your own businesses. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to go over the mar what a marijuana establishment is. Whenever I talk about a marijuana establishment, what am I talking about? When I'm talking about marijuana establishment, I'm talking about one of these 10 license types. I'm about to go over each of these license types with you guys so you know exactly what the requirements are. But they're marijuana cultivators, product manufacturers, craft marijuana cooperative, which I like to call a macro business, and you'll see why in a marijuana micro business, a retailer, which is your good old dispensary, a research facility, transporters, they're like your, uh, um, your middleman, your, they transport between businesses, your laboratories, um, your social consumption pilot program, but I burst that bubble earlier, right? That's not, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. 
and then your delivery only retailers. So when I say marijuana establishment, I'm talking generally about these 10 businesses, okay? All right. So next we're going to talk about the general requirements surrounding these businesses. See, I'm checking the time because I want to make sure that I give you guys time to go home. I mean, I guess you are home to go do something else a little bit earlier. I noticed that I went over a couple times. So my apologies. I'll make up for it. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about business entity requirements, control limitations. You guys have already been through this in, in medical. So you're prepped to even predict what these requirements are going to look like. Okay. I query registration, capitalization requirements, and we're going to talk about agent registration requirements. Okay. Let's start. Just like last time, you have to be registered to do business in Massachusetts. You have to be a corporate domestic entity, and you have to maintain um, good standing with the Secretary of the State of the Commonwealth, the Department of Revenue, and the Department of Unemployment Assistance. This is a new requirement. Prior to the last um, regulatory changes, you only had to alert the Commonwealth and the Department of Revenue. Remember the no hoarding rule? It applies here too. No pet can be can have more than three licenses in these ten in these ten types. So you can't have more than three cultivation facilities. You can't have more than three product manufacturers, but you can have three three of each with and I'll talk about some exceptions with some exceptions like the um, like the macro business and the micro business licenses. All right. So you guys already know what is a pedic, remember? Same thing as medical. We got to bring Cardi back. Also, Cardi's, Cardi's, Cardi's going through some tough times. Send her some love. <laughs> I bet you one day Cardi B is going to watch this and, re and, and realize how many times I've referenced her every semester. Um, okay. So you guys remember a pedic? If a, if a pedic has direct control, how do they have the direct control? It's, you can have the direct control in one of four ways. You're either an owner that has 10% or more financial interest in the business. You have voting rights that are 10% or more in the MTC, or you have the right to veto significant events. You are a close associate, which I told you the CCC doesn't even understand themselves, but you can add it if you'd like. I would just put it in the PEDIC section if you're, when you're filling out your application. So it's a person who holds relevant managerial, operational, or financial interest in the business, and by virtue of that interest or power, they can exercise significant influence over the management, operations, or finances of the, of the marijuana establishment. The fourth way is you have a contractual or other authority to control um, um, through contract or otherwise by be given the right to make major decisions regarding operations and strategic planning, capital allocations, appointing more than 50% of the directors, appointing or removing corporate level officers, making major, uh, major marketing production and financial decisions, executing significant or exclusive contracts, and earning 10% or more of profits or more of dividends, okay? And I told you guys, the, the CCC reads this very broadly. And people get really shifty when they write these contracts because you have, to, you have to look at this from a business perspective, you guys. You're asking somebody to put a million dollars in your business. This is your first time running this business. You have no, I mean, even if you operate in California, these regulations are, diff, are different. The risk that you're asking these investors to take by, have, by giving up um, is tremendous. So a lot of times these investors want to make sure they control every aspect of the business. And the CCC wants to prevent that from happening, from having one company monopolize all the businesses just because they get to take the most risks. Does that make sense? So they take this very seriously. Um, so any person or entity, um, so uh, if you're a pedic, you can be a pedic through indirect control. And the way you have, you have this uh, indirect control is by um, having control over, is being a person with a controlling interest in an indirect holding or parent company of the applicant, or be the CEO or executive director of those companies. And also any person or entity in a position to indirectly control the decision-making of the MTC. That's that broad one that's really expansive. And again, I don't know if I gave you guys this, this why this one is problematic, is because I know people in the industry who are married to people who have felonies, who cannot participate in the industry. But those people have a lot of knowledge about the industry because they went to jail for selling this industry. I mean, for, for selling this product. And so that person is laying in bed 
talking about the industry. Now, are they violating um, the, the, the restrictions of the license because they're technically having an indirect control over the decision making? I don't know. But that's why things have to be very, very separate. And you have to put things in writing that I am not telling my wife what to do. <laughs> she never listens to me anyways. Ask the kids. Like, get that on paper. <laughs> All right. And so you already know if you own an independent testing laboratory, you can't own an interest in any other class. If you have a cultivation facility, and we're going to get down into it, you can only have 100,000 square feet canopy, right? And canopy is calculated and measured using identifiable boundaries of all areas that contain mature plants at any point in time, including the spaces within those boundaries, okay? So um, the, canopy, the canopy can be contiguous or you can be non-contiguous. You can, you can determine how you, how, how you do it. You can determine it based on your room. You can do it on shelves. Either way, it has to be consistent. Um, let's see. I think, so, and I'll give you an example. My cultivation facility in California is 5,000 square feet. We have 50 lights. We have more than 100 pounds. But you get, on average, uh, like 100 pounds per light, right, per um, harvesting. So you harvest five times per year. But it really goes to light and it also goes to the production capacity of that particular plant. So some plants can produce more, more, bi more, more biomass than other plants. So that also plays into the kind of what the strains that you're growing as well. But out in Massachusetts, they grow easy, easy strains that produce a lot. Um, okay. Notice requirements. When you're applying to the CCC for your license, you got to let them know that you have direct control or indirect control, either through one of these four avenues, through ownership, voting rights, that you're close associated, you have contractual or other right to control, or that you have indirect control. In addition, if you own a lab, you got to let, let them know. And if you have a cultivation, cultivation facility, let them know and let them know what's um, the size of the canopy. We're good. Um, and I brought these 10 up again, just to reiterate, you, you can have three of each of these businesses in the state. So you can have a pretty big, a, a pretty big operation in the state. Um, but you still are capped at three retail stores. Um, if you want to be, to have full control. All right, let's start talking about these license types. You guys ready? Good. You have no choice, right? <laughs> Marijuana cultivation, cultivator license. What does that allow you to do? You can cultivate, process, and package your own marijuana and transfer them to other marijuana establishments. In some states like California, you need an independent distributor license. So you don't, it's not already baked into the license. So here in, in Massachusetts, they've baked in the right for you to distribute your own marijuana on your, on your own behalf. Does that make sense? So um, once you cultivate, you can, you can distribute to other cultivators, other product manufacturers, other marijuana establishments, but never to consumers. A craft marijuana cooperative, keep this in your back head, is also a marijuana cultivator under these licenses. Now, I mentioned there are 11 tiers. You can have three licenses. This 100,000 square feet can only be spread across three licenses, three locations. And you can have three, um, 11 tiers. So each location, when you apply, you have to let the CCC know what the canopy is going to be for that particular location. The smallest um, license is 5,000 square feet, and it goes all the way up to 100,000 square feet. And very similar to, and we talked about what a canopy is, same thing um, as, uh, as medical. And we talked about you ain't safe just because you said on your application and you were you were approved for a particular tier. If you're approved for a hundred thousand square feet, but uh, I'm sorry, if you're approved for ten thousand square feet, for example, and you want to expand to a higher uh, tier, you're gonna have to prove that six months before the expansion, you were able to sell eighty five percent of your product. Also, when it's time to renew your license. If you can, if it, if you were unable to sell at least seventy percent of your products within six months of renewal, you will be relegated to a lower tier, and that relegation is not necessarily to the to the next lowest tier, but it, but the relegation will be based on a number of factors. It will be based on whether you suffered catastrophic events, okay, your cultivation and production history, 
transfer, sales, and excise tax payment history, um, whether you, uh, they're going to base it on your existing inventory and inventory history, your sales contracts, right, whether you have any looming contracts for um, other companies, and any other factors relevant to ensuring responsible cultivation, product production, and inventory management. You got it? So this is basically similar, very similar to medical. All right. Next. Any questions? Good. <clears throat> a marijuana product manufacturer license. What does that allow you to do? Now that allows you to make infused products. You can make edibles and topicals. You can obtain, manufacture, process, package marijuana and marijuana products. You can deliver and transfer marijuana in marijuana products to marijuana establishments, um, but they may not deliver or transfer to consumers. Got it? Also, there are no caps on the quantity of production for a marijuana product manufacturer. You can produce as much as you want. There's no relegation or anything of that sort. <clears throat> so what's really gonna drive the market is the cultivation, right? Because it, it's it's the it's it that's going to be the bottleneck for the industry. It's how much marijuana we can produce here in the state. But I want you guys to know, um, and I know your con law, you know, hairs are going to be tingling. But there are states, the tri-state area, is contemplating allowing distribution amongst themselves as they legalize. And we already know that the federal government has not removed cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. So it's going to be interesting to see how those states are able to implement that, those, those statutes and regulations. But that's coming. And when it comes, um, those who are expending a lot of money to create these um, massive cultivation facilities are going to end up suffering, especially if we can get places like California to participate without the federal government interfering. Um, just a heads up for you guys. All right, craft marijuana cooperatives. Now I like to call them macro businesses. No one really calls them that, but I'll tell you why I call them a macro business license. First is because the state has a micro business license. That's the actual name of the license. And the, the purpose of that license is for you to stay micro. Now the craft marijuana cooperative, the purpose of this business is for many people to build wealth together. So it's a macro business where many people could work together. So what does it allow you to do? A craft marijuana cooperative is a type of marijuana cultivator that allows you to cultivate, obtain, manufacture, process, package, and brand marijuana and marijuana products. It also allows you to deliver to marijuana establishments, but not to consumers. There are some limitations on this license, however. You're only allowed to have one craft marijuana cooperative license per business. There are no limits on the number of cultivation locations but there is a limit on the total canopy. So you can have 100,000 square feet, but you're not limited to the three locations that a regular business is. And that's because the concept is that they are forming a cooperative where many farmers, many cultivators are working together to build a brand. Is this making sense? And so, but just know, if you have more than six locations, you're gonna have to submit additional application and license fees, but you're, but you, but, um, you're not, banned from having more than three locations. In addition, this license type is what I like to call a BOGO, buy one, get one free. You're not only allowed to cultivate, you're also allowed to make infused products. It has a baked in craft marijuana cooperative license in it where you're allowed to have three locations where you make, um, where you make marijuana products. So this craft marijuana cooperative, you, have, you can have unlimited locations kept at 100,000 square feet, and you can have three product manufacturing locations. Um, with this license, you have to be organized um, as an LLC in the Commonwealth. They want you to operate according to the seven cooperative principles published by International Cooperative Alliance. Basically, it's like you agree to like that everybody is equal, um, everyone's an employee who, who is a member, those types of uh, principles. Um, <clears throat> I also talked about there are some other restrictions and requirements for this license types. All members of this business have to be residents of Massachusetts for the preceding 12, for the 12 months preceding the filing of the license application. So you were mentioning earlier about some marijuana businesses having, um, having uh, residence requirements. 
There are only two such licenses, and it's the craft marijuana cooperative and the micro business. But the micro business is not all members; it's fifty percent. And the reason why they chose those license types to speak to have the residence requirement is because this ECC contemplates these license types as having a a social justice, a social equity kind of, kind of concept to it, where if you allow MAP people to combine their funds to build a business together, it'll help alleviate some of the barriers than if they were able to do it on their own. Um, and, and so because of that, they and, and also this craft marijuana cooperative license was crafted with farmers in mind, people with a lot of land who want to be able to use it to, to produce cannabis. Um, and that's why at least one member of this business has to have filed a, a Schedule F tax form, which is a tax form that, fa that farmers file. Is that making sense? One of the objectives of, the, of, the, of regulation was to ensure that the industry was diverse. And when I talk about being diverse, oftentimes it seems as if I'm talking about race and gender. They were also thinking about farmers and in women and, and veterans and other in, in other in other groups but the farmers is a group that people don't initially think that the ccc is required to ensure that they have access to the industry as well all right next business the bog the next bogo license there are two bogo licenses a macro license craft marijuana cooperative in the micro business license what this license allows you to do is it is a co-located marijuana operation meaning at one location you can have a tier one marijuana cultivator. Remember that the tier one cultivator was 5,000 square feet. Remember that? So you can do craft marijuana cooperative and, a marijuana, and uh, be a marijuana product manufacturer. Now, as the delivery licenses are currently written, marijuana micro businesses have the right to deliver directly to consumers. They'll be eligible to apply for delivery licenses. But as we move forward in this class, I'm going to have to talk about how these regs are currently written, how it, it doesn't necessarily include them in the draft regulations. We'll talk about that. But um, <clears throat> but um, you you still have to comply for the individual requirements for the tier one in, in, in the marijuana product manufacturers. And there are other restrictions to this license type. Remember I told you the concept of this is for it to be micro. It's so that a business doesn't have to expend a lot of money to, to, to get these two licenses so they combine them into one. Well, you have a, a purchase limit. You can only purchase 2,000 pounds of marijuana or its dry weight equivalent in raw concentrate per year from other marijuana establishments. So when they were giving delivery, the, uh, when they were expanding the marijuana micro business license to include delivery, the reason they did that is because they would not be able to compete. As you'll see, a micro business license cannot, um, cannot be a pedic for any other marijuana establishment, except the social consumption and delivery. So that means that if you can't own another your, a marijuana retailer, and you're making infused products and delivery, how are you gonna be able to compete? How are you gonna be able to get your products on the shelf? So it's gonna be a little bit harder for you. So they contemplate in giving them access to delivery. Now in these new, um, in the regs, they, they did not necessarily include them in there. So we'll see if, if the CCC did that by error, if that's really, um, <clears throat> if they really intend to remove that option from you. Okay, so there is a residency requirement as I mentioned, a majority of the executives or members have to be residents of Massachusetts for no less than 12 months prior to application. So that's 51% of the owners have to be um, Massachusetts residents. And the other great thing about this license is your application fees and license fees are waived if you, um, <clears throat> if you are applying for, for this. Um, sorry, the, the application is waived and, and the licensing fee is 50%. Any questions? Bueno. Next, your good old marijuana retailer license. Now, this is your average, this is your good old marijuana dispensary. Um, I don't know if you guys have visited any of the dispensaries in the area. I would do it, especially when I start talking about compliance, um, the operational compliance, because then you can go in there with a different eye. Um, so a marijuana retailer, what are they allowed to do? They are allowed to purchase, transport, sell, or otherwise transfer marijuana, marijuana products to marijuana establishments and sell to consumers. 
Um, so they can act as a middleman or they can sell directly to consumers. A retailer cannot deliver marijuana or marijuana products to consumers. Um, and as you'll see, unless they have a marijuana establishment endorsement, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> you cannot allow so on-site consumption by consumers, so there's no sampling the chocolate scent, okay? Um, a retailer um, has to operate all activities solely at the address identified, and they can only allow persons who are 21 years of age to access the area, unless you're co-located. If you're co-located, meaning that you are in a marijuana uh, treatment center, you're an MTC, and also a, uh, a marijuana retailer. Is this making sense? Great. Next license, the marijuana research facility license. A marijuana research facility license allows you to cultivate, purchase, or otherwise acquire marijuana for the purpose of conducting research regarding marijuana products. A research facility may, may be an academic institution, nonprofit corporation, or a domestic corporation or entity authorized to do business in Massachusetts. Any research involving humans must be authorized by an institutional review board. A research facility may not sell marijuana cultivated under its research. All research regarding marijuana must be conducted by individuals 21 years of age or older. So, um, not many, there aren't many applications in the queue for this particular license type. The benefit of this is really going to come down to marketing. The CCC will allow you to put, I mean, you'll have to deal with the FDA, but the CCC will allow you to make certain claims on your products if you can prove that you've had some research, if you can back it with scientific research. So a lot of companies will pay these research facilities to, to, to back the claims that they're making that their products have. Okay, laboratory licenses. What are those? So there are two types of laboratories in the state. There's the independent testing laboratories and the standards testing lab laboratory. The independent testing laboratory is basically the labs that we go to to get our products tested. And the standards testing laboratory is the one that, that oversees the independent testing laboratories if something goes wrong. So if the, if the CCC has, a, has a, an inkling that a particular testing laboratory is not operating compliantly, they'll get a standards testing laboratory to come in and, and go over and, and audit that testing laboratory to ensure that things are happening well. But a standards testing laboratory is nothing more than an independent testing laboratory with that cert specification. So to be an independent testing laboratory, you have to be accredited by the ISO <clears throat> um, or by a, a, a third party accrediting body that is a signatory to the um, International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation. Um, I'm currently helping one of my students, um, Nicole Schneider. She is opening a laboratory in Worcester. So it's pretty cool going through that process and seeing one of you guys come and start your own businesses. I, I, I can have her, I should have her come talk to the class and talk about her process and how she was able to transition the information she learned in this class into starting her own uh, laboratory. Is that something you'd be interested in? See, I can have Nicole come through. Um, an executive, so um, so we are, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be the dead horse, but an executive or member of a marijuana establishment cannot own a financial interest or other interest in an independent testing laboratory. No individual employee of the lab providing testing services for marijuana establishment may receive direct or indirect financial compensation from any marijuana establishment. So if I'm working for a, a cultivation facility, I can't be paying any mar anybody who works at that testing laboratory. It doesn't matter if you are conducting the test, if you're the security officer, no one's getting paid from you. Is that making sense? Unless, and you know, unless they, they actually work there. All right, standard testing laboratories, and I talked about that, that this is basically the, 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 the laboratory that oversees the um, compliance in the operations of the standard laboratories to ensure that they're not operating in, in, a, in a method that would um, place the public health in, in harm. Any questions? Nice. Last year, um, I, I had Takashi 69 all over this because the standard testing laboratory is also known as, a, as the snitching laboratory because they have to snitch on the independent testing laboratories. 
But then I decided that, you know, I should stop being so talking. I should stop talking against snitching because I guess snitching saves lives sometimes. But don't let the streets know I said that. <laughs> All right, let's get into marijuana transporter license. What is that? So this is an entity that's allowed to purchase, obtain, and possess cannabis or marijuana product solely for the purpose of transporting temporary storage, sale, and distribution to marijuana establishments. They cannot transport to consumers. I personally love this license type, and I and I think that when the 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 license, when the market in Massachusetts becomes saturated, these transporter licenses are going to be very instrumental in you being able to source the best products because what they can do is they can basically go to all of the dispense all the cultivators all the product manufacturers around and have them make specific products for them and they can curate a list of products that they exclusively own now you don't have to have exclusive deals i'm just giving you options for this license type where they carry these products and then they can source them to dis to dispensaries themselves this is something that dispensaries don't necessarily want to do and if you can create a whole product line where you can pr provide like the, your shelving where they say, I have this many shelves, this is what I need. And you provide them the feel of the products that they want. This is how you use this marijuana transporter license. And that's how I would hire you as a business. So you're allowed to operate in two ways. You could be a uh, the warehousing middleman that I just talked about, but you can also act like, um, like FedEx where you pick a product on behalf of someone and you deliver it somewhere else where you're not delivering your own products. Is that making sense? <clears throat> so there are two types of transporter licenses. So there is one that is called the third party transporter license. The third party transporter license is somebody who does not have a marijuana establishment in Massachusetts already. The only thing they wanna do in this business is be a transporter, okay? An existing licensee transporter is someone who already has a marijuana establishment. It could be a cultivator, it could be a product manufacturer, it could be a retailer. But you want to have the option to transport on behalf of other businesses. And you would apply for an existing licensee transporter license. Is that making sense? Awesome. Um, <clears throat> So marijuana social consumption pilot program. So I'm going to talk about it, even though we're not going to be able to enjoy it very, very soon. I will teach you guys how to not spend $20 million to open a facility. Okay, this is why I want you to get through this program. Um, I want you guys to create your own marijuana businesses for this class. It's because if you have questions that are naturally going to arise, I will answer them for you and save you time and money. Is that a deal? So the reason why... so. You're right. So cultivation does require a lot of upfront investment, but why would you do that? It's because taxation. IRS code 280E says that you can't take your ordinary business expenses and deductions if you are transacting in the sale of marijuana businesses. However, you can take deduction for your cost of goods sold. Your cost of goods sold is the cost of acquiring the product that you intend to sell, right? So in the retail space, the only thing you can deduct within that operation is the cost of, of, um, of purchasing the product. In a cultivation space, you can deduct everything. So you can make way more money that way. The reason I'm vertically integrated is because it makes more money, to it makes more sense to funnel, uh, to, to, to put all, most of my resources in cultivation so I can take all those deductions and then have a very small retail space where I operate very, very meekly. When it comes to cost of goods sold alone, and um, that's part one. Part two, Marijuana in the in the market right now, you're buying it at five thousand dollars a pound. It costs about six hundred and fifty-seven dollars for some people to make it. Some people it costs them a thousand dollars a pound. But let's stick at the six hundred and fifty-seven dollars per pound to produce. And it's being sold at five thousand dollars per pound. When you break down a, a pound of marijuana, you could make ten thousand dollars off of it when you start breaking it down into edibles. So you're, you're talking about $667 that I flipped to $10,000 if I'm vertically integrated versus buying $5,000 worth of product. You see, the, you see what I'm talking about? So that's what my reasoning was for this. Social consumption establishments. So these are the, the edibles. This is, where, so this is where you can go into a place and eat. And the reason I'm saying edibles is because that's all you basically gonna be able to do in these facilities. Um, so at these places, you can purchase marijuana 
Um, they can purchase marijuana from a cultivator, from manufacturer, from micro business. They can sell marijuana products to consumers at an approved premise. They can allow the consumers to consume on the premise. Um, it, right now, they're on, they were only contemplating brick and mortar consumption establishments, and they were only contemplating cafes. The reason I'm saying this is when they originally wrote the, the, the social consumption um, establishment provisions, they contemplated places like, um, like spas, like spas that you can go and get THC treatment, um, movie theaters, and uh, you know, all kinds of places. There was a, an adult, adult entertainment place that was, that was also considered. So these are all the places that they were contemplating putting um, social consumption. But right now, the only ones that they're, they're allowing are the, these brick and mortar cafe-esque ones. So um, in these, you can sell marijuana products. You can allow consumers to consume marijuana products solely on the premise. You cannot, did I put the heartbreaking news back here? I don't know if I put it there. So anyways, you guys, you cannot leave the premises with any marijuana that you purchase at a social consumption site. You have to dump it on your way out. Why would I go to a place like that? <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys go and enjoy yourselves and throw out your weed. But also, like, think about it. You, you, buy, you eat a brownie. It takes at least 45 minutes for it to, to, to kick in. An hour into this thing, you, do you want to stay at this event for that long? So I think they just... The reason I'm saying this is at these social consumption facilities, you're not permitted to smoke indoors. There will be no smoking of any, of, of any kind. You are permitted to create spaces outdoors, but you have to get, um, you have to get permission to do that. And is it in here? No, I, when I talk about operations, on top of that, you have to get, they're gonna give you this thing I like to call a Buzz Killington card. Why is it a Buzz Killington card? It's because right before, when you put your order, they're gonna give you a card that says marijuana will impair your driving and it'll make you remember, have you agreed to assume all the risks of having fun? Yes. So then you return the Buzz Killington card and then they provide you your edible or whatever it is and, and you'll consume them here. But then last year when I was being shady and like being very negative about this social consumption, um, I had some students ask me about alternate forms of consumption. There are other ways that people can consume. Have you guys seen the AirPods where you can put it in there and it's like you just smoke in the air and it's not a vapor, it's just little air. Anyways, the way these, I see these consumption places operating is having novel ways of consuming that do not fall under the category of smoking like a blunt or a, a J. All right, I can't always just leave the shade. I always gotta balance it. I hope you notice that. <laughs> Okay, um, so right now the the way that the, the there's the pi there's a pilot program that they've written into the regulation, and under this pilot program, the state can select up to twelve municipalities to participate in the program. Um, uh, when they're selecting these mun municipalities, they base that decision on a number of factors, and that includes a geographic location because they don't want all these to be um, uh, bundled in one place, the social economic characteristics of the area. They, they sometimes don't want them in, in some areas because they think it might incentivize certain activities. And they also look at population size of municipal um, applicants. Um, an interested municipality has to apply to the CCC and um, the application for participation has to be signed by, by the municipality. My recommendation for this, even though this might be two years away, say it's three years away, what I would do if I were in your position and I wanted a social consumption site, I would start talking to the municipalities now. Part one, you guys are lawyers. I would offer to prepare the application for them in advance and, and, and help them craft the program. Because one thing you'll know when you meet these towns, they're very ignorant about the Cannabis Control Commission and they actually look to us to educate them. So if you want this, you go to them and say, look, I've already done the work. I, I'm preparing the application. Let me, let me see who I gotta work with, what I gotta like, make it as easy as possible for them. That way you are in the forefront to be, to get one of these host agreements when they start issuing them out. Got it? You show the, alcohol, can you show alcohol here too or no? Just no, because they have this thing called poly drug use. Um, and they do not allow multiple drugs to be consumed in one area. But at, at one time, that's something that can change in the future, but right now it's no bueno. And I, even in, um, places in California, what you'll see is they'll sell virgin liquors, 
So they'll sell virgin beers that are infused with THC, um, virgin wines that are infused with THC. I currently have a partner working with a winery to create um, infused wines, but there's no alcohol in there. One day, one day we'll be able to have all the fun. So in, in, in this, and I realize in this country, you guys don't like to have all the fun all at once. You kind of, it's incremental and I like it. I have something to look forward to, you know? <laughs> all right, let's go. So um, let's see, what do they consider? Um, so this pilot program has an exclusivity period, just like delivery. This, this delivery period, this exclusivity period is two years from the time that somebody first gets one of these licenses. And um, when it comes time to evaluate and when the two year period is over, the CCC is gonna get together and determine whether the purpose for establishing the, the exclusivity period was established. Um, and so they'll look at um, whether communities that have been disproportionately harmed um, are increasing their participation in the industry. And remember I told you they care about farmers, whoops. So um, they wanna make sure that um, uh, farmers and businesses of all sizes are participating. They want to make sure that licenses granted to businesses with uh, majority e economic empowerment and social equity program participants and micro businesses and craft marijuana businesses are in the program. So the CCC is really contemplating this exclusivity period to ensure that they can have as, as a diverse of a industry as possible. Okay. You guys ready for delivery? Great. I'm, I'm ready for delivery as well. Okay, so deliver. So what I'm gonna do tonight, I'm gonna talk to you about how the law currently sits. And then I'm gonna talk about the proposed regulations that have been approved by the CCC, but they have not, they have not gone through final approvals. They're still taking, they're still in a public comment period. And after tonight, I hope you have enough information to, if you feel compelled to put in your own written comment, but let, let, let's talk about wh wh where we are right now. So as the law currently sits, this is pre, without the, the new approvals, delivery, there are delivery only retailers who are authorized to deliver directly to consumers and registered qualifying patients. Um, they can do so from, from only, the only places they can deliver from right now is from a marijuana retailer and they cannot provide retail locations or have it, um, or have locations um, accessible to the public. And in addition, in order for them to deliver marijuana, they have to do it um, pursuant to a delivery agreement that they've executed with a marijuana retailer on whose behalf they're going to be conducting these deliveries. So in effect, these license types operate like an Uber Eats where you go and you pick, the, you pick up the order from the marijuana establishment and they'll pay you for the delivery charge and you deliver it to the, for, to the, um, to the consumer. The problem with this license type is it, it wasn't financially feasible because these entities still have to go through licensing. They still have to get a host agreement. They still have to have retail uh, a, a location and it still costs a lot, of, a lot of money to go through that process and you still have to undergo IRS code 280E, which you guys has an effective tax rate of 70%. So when you factor all of that in, these people were not making any money at all. And so there was a massive public outcry and the CCC listened and they, and they, and they produced the changes. But under the current regulations, there's a 24 month exclusivity period from the moment the first um, company is licensed Again, the, the goal of the program is to encourage full participation in the regulated marijuana industry by people from communities that have been previously harmed by the war on, on, on drugs. They can extend the exclusivity period and they've, con they've extended it to three years with the new regs. Um, during this 24 month period, they'll be collecting data to, to determine whether the goal of the program is actually being met. And they're going to look just like they did for social consumption to see if the, the industry is becoming more diverse. If at the end of two years, they're not seeing full participation based on these factors like number of registered agents or social equity applicants, you know, all the ones we talked about previously, they're going to then choose to extend that two-year period. Um, 
the 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 there's a i'm going to start we're going to get into the draft regulations and when we're talking about the draft regulations i'll talk about some of the t2 about who's mad in the industry about these draft regulations and who's fighting to take down the uh the implementation of the of the approvals so under the draft regulations there are two types of marijuana licenses for delivery there are the limited delivery licenses and there are the marijuana wholesale delivery licenses. And I'm gonna talk about what each of them are. So let's talk about the limited delivery licenses. <clears throat> Under these licenses, you can deliver directly from a marijuana retailer to patients or caregivers from an MTC or a marijuana delivery. And you do that pursuant to a delivery agreement. So it kind of, it kind of uh, mirrors what we saw in the current regulations that we have. Um, a limited delivery license may be an owner or have a controlling interest in a cultivation facility, product manufacturing. They can own any other business. There are no restrictions on that. Um, but they can possess no more than three limited delivery licenses. <clears throat> Is this making sense? So under these limited delivery licenses, it's not appearing as if they're counting as a retail license. Remember, you're allowed to have three retail licenses in the state. At one point, they were thinking that a delivery license would count as a retail store. So you could have two brick and mortars, for example, in one delivery license. Got it? So now they're saying it's seeming as if you can have three delivery licenses where you have three locations from which you can deliver on behalf of a marijuana retailer or a MTC. Um, does that make sense? Good. Next, they have a second license. And this license type was really to address the issues that I talked about earlier. This one is called the Marijuana Wholesale Delivery License. This allows um, a marijuana delivery licensee to wholesale or warehouse finished marijuana products acquired from a marijuana cultivator, marijuana product manufacturer, micro business, or craft marijuana cooperative and sell and deliver directly to consumers. Okay. So this, unlike the other license, is allowing these, the um, licensees to buy directly from cultivators and deliver, and deliver, to, um, and deliver to, um, to consumers. In addition, they can warehouse. They can have them do exclusive lines for them where they can um, sell those exclusive lines on their platforms. So you can see how this marijuana wholesale delivery license provides these um, social equity economic empowerment applicants more opportunity to, to, to make money. The first license type, the one that's pursuant to delivery agreement, I think that's a license type that a company like mine would go for because I have my own cultivation facility and product manufacturer. All I would have to do is take my, is, is sell my product from my product manufacturer wholesale to the delivery agreement and, and slide the, the, um, those payments that way. Does that make sense? So it wouldn't hurt me. But for the uh, uh, another person who doesn't have a brick and mortar store, this wholesale delivery license is what they would go for. So if you have a brick and mortar like you do, there's no incremental cost, right? Can people deliver in their own cars? You don't have to have like a special car to deliver, right? People could just deliver well, their own cars. You, the hire car, you do have, the car has to be outfitted. So you do have, the car has to have, um, it has to have a GPS that you're tracking 24 hours you have to have a method of communicating with people you have to have safes in there um one safe for money one safe for marijuana so there's some things that you have to do in the vehicle but you could technically use you know if you got a you know a yaris lying around i don't see why you can't pull up in a yaris um i've heard some nutty 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 things i have this there's this one company that wants to deliver using an ice cream truck and I, as the CEO of my business, I'm like, what about gas? Like, this makes no sense. Like, cut it out. A Prius will do much better and it, it'll go faster. And you don't have to, you don't have the extra weight that that vehicle has. You don't need that much weight. Anyways, but that's up to them. I think, you know, if you want to pay extra to get delivered from a, an ice cream truck, I think it's pretty cool. Maybe once in a while we can use the ice cream truck. All right. So um, a marijuana wholesale delivery licensee can operate a warehouse for the purpose of storing finished products, which was not permitted under the um, old regime. No PEDIC in a wholesale delivery license can obtain or be granted more than a combined total of three wholesale delivery and or marijuana retail licenses. So you see the difference here. Here, if you're a wholesale delivery license, they actually count it as a retail license. So it actually cuts into the brick and mortar locations that you can have. 
Is that making sense? Um, a wholesale delivery license is considered to be a marijuana retail license for purposes of license cap, cap limits. So it's, it's, it's interesting, it's fun. Um, there are people who are opposing this. Now, the exclusivity period before was two years. Under the new, under the new regs, they are 36 months. So they're now three years. People are upset because there are individuals who are okay to do the two years. And there are other people who didn't think that they would have this exclusivity period at all and had entered the medical facility, medical space thinking that they would be permitted to also deliver an adult use. And because they do not fall under an economic empowerment certificate or a social equities program, they can't participate in delivery. And they are mad. And a lot of them are members of the Cannabis Dispensary Association. Um, and they're currently spending a lot of money to lobby against it. Now, the problem with them taking the stance is a PR move. They don't want to be on the side of history where, where they get boycotted by the industry for going against this license type that's supposed to help right the wrongs of marijuana enforcement in Massachusetts. So there, there's a real moral ethical debate taking place in, amongst these dispensary owners to figure out how to navigate um, these, the, 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 these new regulations. So the exclusivity period is now for three years. And um, before, when it was written, they were, they were going to give it to micro businesses and also, um, yeah, they were going to give it to, to micro businesses. As these regulations are written, I don't see micro businesses in there. So now it's looking like for the next three months, it's only going to be economic empowerment priority and social equity program participants. Um, and one reason why that's not completely unfair is the social equity program, as we'll talk about if we get to it um, um, in this class. Did I promise to leave you guys, to let you guys go early? I will. I'll give you, let me get through this part and then I'll let you go. Um, so um, th yeah, this exclusivity period does not have micro businesses included in there. And so a lot of companies were going and they're opening micro businesses knowing that they would be permitted to open and deliver. So if that's not included in there, that's going to be an issue for, for, those, for those individuals. So now I told you there's a public comment period. If you feel any way about the license types that I just talked about, whether you want the CCC to change them, keep them, maintain them, if there's something that's, that you see that they're allowing that you would like change, I, the deadline to submit your comment is 5 p.m. October 15th, and you email them to the commissioner, and I, I mean to commission at cccmass.com, cccmass.com, big mama can't talk tonight. Um, and I've put a link to um, the notice of the public comment in these slides. And I think I'm pretty sure I uploaded these slides right before class tonight. So you should have access to this. So if you have, if you feel passionately about this, go read, read up on it. Um, and let the CCC know what you think. All right. So I'm not going to get into equity provisions tonight. Why? Because for once in my life, I, I'd like to, um, for once in my life, I'd like to keep my promise. Okay. <laughs> so if you guys do not have any questions, we're going to take it from equity provisions next week, and then I'm going to dive into municipal ordinances and, and um, community host agreements. And then hopefully I can start touching on the operational requirements um, for, these, um, for these marijuana establishments.